All righty, we're here. So, welcome to the first episode of the AdQuick Advertising Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris Gaddick. I'm VP of Growth here at AdQuick, and I'm joined by my co-host Adam Singer, who just joined us as VP of Marketing. Hey, everyone. And for our first podcast episode, we figured we'd bring somebody close to home, and we would invite our CEO and founder, Matt O'Connor. Hey. And um, we chose Matt. Matt has a very interesting story. Um, he's been, you know, he's le led expansion teams. He's been in the marketing space, um, and he has a unique perspective on advertising and marketing that uh, very few have. Given that, you know, we decided to build a company around traditional channels. But I was hoping maybe you could uh, sh share some a little bit about your story and how you got here and uh, what inspired you to create AdQuick. Yeah, absolutely. So. Kind of the medium length version is uh, when I had a bootstrap startup that eventually failed, I looked into getting outdoor advertising for the first time. Um, I wasn't in the city where I was looking to buy the ads, and so it was a bunch of internet research. And ultimately, I submitted a bunch of contact dust forms and simply wanted to see what was available. Took a couple of weeks. I didn't hear back from some, um, got some PDFs back from others, and ultimately um, actually bribed some friends with pizza and beer <laughs> to put a balcony banner right above where the street furniture would have been. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, that's interesting. Maybe there's something around, well, A, it's hard and unnecessarily shitty to buy a an outdoor advertising. Second, you know, maybe there's something about creating new inventory. Um, the latter turned out to be a pretty big gray area, and so um, there's plenty of permitted and legal outdoor advertising that exists that's still hard to find. So that started planting the seed. Um, fast forward a few years later, I joined Instacart when it was uh, pretty young and we were in a couple cities. Uh, I did a lot of the expansion, and so as we grew, raised funding, our marketing started to get more robust. And you know, of course, like many companies, we start with digital acquisition. Um, but eventually, we wanted to really get louder in the real world with the cities we were launching. And so we went to uh, look at what billboards were available in Indianapolis. Uh, again, we weren't from there. Finding it took weeks. Um, the formats were all different. Um, it was just really hard to find the answer to a pretty simple question, what's the best billboard or set of billboards for our company? Um, so, you know, the five years later, the buying process hadn't changed. When we did get the outdoor advertising live with Instacart, we heard so many anecdotes make their way back to our small team from customers to shoppers to retail partners like, oh, we saw the billboard. So it was like, okay, great. That's fuzzy. That feels great. Mm -hmm. You know, great anecdotes. Um, we also saw uh, directionally a, a much stronger performance in the user acquisition in that market. So between those two things, we were like, hey, yeah, this is working. This is great, but it's kind of a pain in the ass to buy, and we only have directional metrics on uh, whether it's working. And to really truly understand that, we would have needed you know, more data science or engineering resources, and we were a growing startup. We didn't have extra... Uh, bandwidth to stop the train and, and figure out whether these billboards work. So we ended up not doing it uh, mm -hmm. or only throwing a couple uh, you know, dollars at it occasionally. So uh, as I went to, you know, I knew there was a pain point on the buying side. That's right. pretty clear. Um, you know, the NPS of, of out of home buying is very, very low um, because it's all manual, slow, et cetera. Um, so talking to, you know, the media owner side, as I was thinking about starting the company, I realized, you know, they don't have software that makes it easy for them to propose in a modern fashion. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a pain point. They also have pretty high vacancy. It's not like they're French laundry and you can't get a reservation <laughs> for months, which I would have thought. I thought, oh, mm -hmm. they can afford to have a crummy buying experience because they don't have uh, any excess capacity. So what's the point? Right. So... And then the final linchpin is that, you know, as everybody in this room and most people listening, like digital performance marketing has changed marketing forever in a one way direction. There's only going to be more and more quantification, accountability, performance, analytics, attribution. And so out of home was severely lacking in that capacity. Um, and so at the end of the day, the simple thing that AdQuick is solving is making it easy to buy and find out their advertising and easy to measure. And so it's simple uh, to describe, very difficult to execute because there's so many different um, media owner players, uh, customer types, mm -hmm. um, you know, actions a user can take after being exposed. But 
you know, as we've seen and, and as we're progressing towards, once you have that, there's a great amount of momentum and excitement. And um, it's really cool to be able to kind of inject new life into the oldest advertising medium that exists. Great. So it's, it's fair to say that, you know, uh, out of home has been fairly siloed in terms of the marketing mix. It's been very difficult to measure and include into a uh, integrated marketing plan. Can you shed some light on like when you were at Instacart, perhaps, how did uh, how did y'all think about how out of home fit into the space? Were there any impacts on your digital channels? Were, were there uh, any favorable things that you discovered that you can share? And I think that'd be a great segue into kind of going into what we've seen in the last year and how that's going to affect us in the in the coming years. Yeah, so candidly, we were a pretty immature marketing org. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the first level threshold to whether we were going whether we were going to do a channel is how easy and fast it was right. to execute. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't have a lot of you know mixed media modeling or any mixed media modeling. So it was a combination of ease and confidence in effectiveness, neither of which existed, although we had pretty strong hints at at the effectiveness from the anecdotes and and directional movement in our uh, performance. And so I think it's, you know, there's, millions of businesses in the US and I think it's really underrated what the ease of execution can do really I don't think that's exclusive to advertising I think right. that's you know look at e-commerce like you make it easier to do something people are going to do more of it so um you know we weren't as sophisticated as you know maybe some of the now performance teams that exist but ease of execution and confidence were some of the biggest things that we were looking for right on Excellent. So um, one of the things that we've seen in the last year is uh, the playbooks of yesteryear um, are either being exhausted or they require significant, significant modification. And I'm, Adam, you've been, I don't know, how long have you been a marketer? Uh, a you're, long time. You're not, you're, you're, you're not calling yourself, I'm an old, right? Yeah, we, you know, I've been marketing websites or content you know since 2000 2001 so so let's let's go back to that that one piece where we're talking about um, basically all the budgets and all the channel mix and all the uh, strategies that you know uh, a lot of brands have employed and or their agencies on their behalf have employed are uh, so, some are getting to a point where their efficacy is kind of plateauing. Um, what are you seeing in terms of uh, how marketers are spending their advertising and uh, what kind of led to that in the in the previous years, would you say? I mean, I, I think historically online marketing has always been in flux and we've been lulled into this false sense of security in a fang world for the past decade. And that's not normal. It's actually historically been, you know, think of it like a stock portfolio. You mm -hmm. needed this big diversified amount of bets, whether, you know, a mix of affiliate marketing and email marketing and doing PR and um, doing SEM and, you know, all these different tactics would come together and you would experiment and sort of get them better over time, treat them as ongoing process and you know, figure out what converts best for you. And I think marketers have gotten a little bit lulled into this easy world where they think, you know, I'm just going to run Facebook ads and just going to run Google ads. And, you know, I'm probably if I'm a startup, I'm not even going to do anything with TV because that's too expensive and too hard. Mm -hmm. Now there's CTV, by the way, which is, you know, a cool channel. But I think now we're getting a little bit back to um, what the Internet used to be because people don't know what's going to happen next. You know, we don't know where social is going. We don't know how measurable things will be in a post GDPR world in a post, you know, Apple new privacy regime world. And so this is the essence of being a really great marketer is not to say, well, you know, it used to be easy. I'm just going to throw my hands in the air. It's, you know, what tools can I use now? And so one of the reasons I was actually excited to join AdQuick is I had a very similar experience as Matt in the past, wherein when I wanted to buy out of home ads, say, surrounding an event, you know, I was having to fill out forms and do, you know, call up um, these kind of, you know, interesting mix on the tech adoption spectrum of companies to say, how do I get this? And they would send me back PDFs and ultimately I would run the ad and I would get a report that I would stick in the back of a QBR and no one would ever look at it, right? There were no analytics dashboards. So that's why I had quick at school. But um, <laughs> the point notwithstanding is I think it's on marketers to understand what 
is important for their business today and on a go forward, as well as understand what won't matter, right? right. So we'll talk about um, some of the bets companies have made with metaverse experiences and other things in a little bit. But you know, I think in the past few years, we've seen a return to form with things like email, for example. Mm -hmm. And email has always been a great, highly effective tactic that if you stayed focused on building an email list, you're not concerned with whatever chaos is happening you know, at Twitter or Facebook because you you have this list that's your own asset. So um, that's just one example of you, you know, getting sort of too attached to these shiny objects instead of figuring out channels that work, whether it's email, whether it's out of home, whether it's you know even TV and doing a better job with them over time versus sort of chasing your tail. Um, but to your point, you know, this is an interesting time because there is so much change. And as a marketer, you can look at it one of two ways. You can be like, well, they move my cheese. Or you could be like, well, I could be the first to do something super cool here. I could stay focused. You know, there's probably some alpha to be had and trying out channels that other people are ignoring. Um, so I think it's a great time to be a marketer. I think this is going to start to get really fun again. And so, I mean, we were really spoiled, uh, you know, in the last decade, we've basically had, you know, the most accurate targeting possible. We had people's behaviors on how they were interacting on other websites, so on and so forth. And the need to diversify around, uh, away from these these uh, channels that have, I guess, less of an impact where the targeting becomes a little bit more challenging due to the, the, the re I mean, I'm not going to go into the iOS 14, IDFA stuff. You could do a whole podcast on I, that. Yeah, we could definitely do a whole <laughs> podcast on that. But um, I, one thing that I have started seeing, in, especially from our clients in the last year, was you know, you taking these audiences and kind of uh, basically uh, getting them to be to play nicely with traditional channels. And Matt, I'd love you to I'd, I'd love for you to kind of chime in on you know how you're seeing uh, some uh, brands and uh, and their agencies kind of leverage audiences to you know basically use uh, traditional media as you know, a performance or a performance branding channel, if you will. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, I don't think this is um, provocative or controversial or super insightful, but first party data is becoming more and more and more valuable when you can't rely on the platforms to lead you to your customers. So one of the cool things that, you know, out of home provides and that we're seeing our, our clients do is take that first party data, overlay it to the world, uh, specifically the, with us more the US and look where the opportunities are. So um, because out of home is national, highly variable from a CPM uh, and reach perspective, uh, we can show the advertisers pockets of arbitrage that they didn't have. Um, another amazing trend for you know marketers um, that opens up the options for them is that their customers are everywhere now. Right. Um, you know, Paramount doesn't have to focus on the top 15 DMAs because that's where 90% of their moviegoers are. Right. They're now with Paramount Plus and everybody with a TV is their potential customers. So it opens up the geographic boundaries that they're no longer encumbered by. So that first party data being able to inject, optimize and arbitrage in traditional media is what's happening. CTV is taking a, a advantage of that. And so um, it's pretty exciting. It may be intimidating at first for a lot of marketers, but really in the end, it's going to get easier and should be more exciting than anything. Yeah. And historically, you know, marketers have always advertised in their backyard, yeah. whether it be for vanity purposes or what have you. But um, I think uh, the interesting thing is the ability to now take these old fashioned uh, marketing channels, marketing tactics, and apply these audiences, and then you unlock all these potential new customers in secondary and tertiary markets. Adam, do you have any experience that you'd like to chime in on with uh, when it comes to yeah, yeah, you finding, know, finding little nuggets of gold? Well, you said something really interesting, and I think digital marketers in particular are guilty of this. You said, you know, marketers bias to advertising in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. And so I think that applies with digital channels as well. Mm -hmm. And I think marketers have become overly 
bullish and exciting on if they're a Redditor and they're like, we really need to advertise on Reddit. Mm-hmm. And Reddit might be a great channel, but that bias is present online too. Mm-hmm. Think about how to disseminate your message big, have these larger than life ads that are super bold, super audacious. And then you can sort of drill down as you remarket to people, as you build segments. But I think like, you know, whether it's a Super Bowl ad or whether it's, you know, a really fun creative out of home ad or whether it's a, a you know, a CTV ad that's going to a lot of people um I, I think like starting there for the highest level if you wanted to build the next the next coke you have to do that you have to do mass too right. and the way that we do mass now is so different we're talking about you know finding undervalued places i think out of home is cool because you could find if, if you're a startup you could find all these markets that no one else is really targeting and you could have the whole town right. talking about it and you can do something like that from your desk with just a few clicks now um you know i think Thinking about all of these um, sort of traditional channels where you couldn't do digital things, and now now you kind of can. Um, I I still think you know thinking big to start, and then getting smaller as you go on is is probably a good a good way to think about it. Matt, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I just think we should all know uh, or hear if you're down with OPP, whether or not. <laughs> naughty by nature. Love it, love it, love it. Um, okay, so well. Given that th- we've unlocked this new opportunity as marketers, uh, I love using the term performance branding. Um, a lot of people's, uh, a lot of people's, like I said earlier, a lot of people's mixes are um, in flux, ca- ca- uh, currently changing, and as advertisers move their dollars around, um, that leads to uh, obviously some sort of inflationary, some inflationary pressures on the cost of the media. And maybe, Matt, maybe you could chime in on stuff that you're seeing in terms of the pricing. I know Critio just put out yeah. an advertiser's um, emerging channels. Uh, maybe you could touch touch upon that a little bit. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see now that the long tail is having some revival, what that does to, to prices on, you know, Google and Facebook in particular. Um, but, yeah, with, you know, the combination of ad blocking, ATT, these are making, these are inflationary because it's limiting the supply and targeting in a lot of ways. And uh, really, uh, it'll be interesting. I think one of the canaries in the coal mine or, you know, uh, kind of foreshadowing pieces will be following what Twitter's able to do with non-ad supported revenue. Right. If they show that they're able to, and, and I'm not really weighing in on, I, I just know they're trying this, is mm-hmm. you know how much of a revelation would that be if uh, social media becomes supported by even half non-ad revenue? That That's a really big deal. And you know I know people who are hardcore um, Reddit, um, in any social media user would uh, some large portion that would pay ten bucks a month right. to uh, have an ad free network, and and the platforms have never wanted to rock their own ship. That's right. you know the hand that feeds them, and so um, you know throwing a curveball into their own mix doesn't make sense. But you know Elon coming out of left field and you know basically desperately trying a bunch of different things will be interesting to see. And so the reason I bring that up with respect to cost and inflation is that if a large portion of Twitter users over the next 12 to 24 months convert and do the you know, Twitter blue that's partially non-ad supported or predominantly non-ad supported, then you know maybe Facebook says, okay, yeah, we, we want to try that too. What are the perks we can offer? Same thing with Reddit and, uh, and so on. So yeah, right now there's a combination of, um, you know, the Yogi Berra, so crowded, nobody ever goes there. Right. And social media, obviously, billions of people are using it and the engagement is still very high. But, um, you know, advertisers are starting to look elsewhere. And if the social media companies can monetize elsewhere, it's going to continue to accelerate that CPM inflation. I also continue to be bullish on I mentioned email. I think companies building their own lists right. are sort of creating their own leverage outside of ad networks, outside of what a TV channel might do or a social network might do. And so, you know, however you can do that and have that direct line to your customer, I think that's always been powerful. A lot of brands have stayed heads down on this. Um, one of my very first consulting clients, International Dairy Queen, uh, built the first million member uh, email list via their Blizzard fan club. And they would frequently send things like BOGOs to customers, you know, Mm -hmm. buy one, get one free for Blizzards. And so that list is 
still really powerful for them. And what they did with that when social um, launched brand accounts is we also built the first million member Facebook group. We were the first QSR that did that. Right. And so they were only able to do that because they have their own sovereignty online. And so that notion, I think, in addition to um, advertisers sort of always have to chase where the ball is going, where they can right. reach eyeball, eyeballs. But I think the really smart companies build their own leverage in addition to the to the rented channels. Cool. So let's talk about where the, uh, I guess, where the puck is going. And uh, do we want to go chat GPT or do we want to go TikTok? Um, you know, obviously, those are the big two big names in the space right now. And a lot of people are Did we not ban about TikTok in America? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the, the politicians uh, in Congress have done so, but uh, I, don't, I don't have any more in, intel on that. I mean, I, I'm so torn because, you know, I don't love TikTok. Um, I don't. I don't like the notion of my brain being hacked on video f to watch the next thing. So I don't have it on my phone. So I just let the rest of the internet surface the interesting ones. And the interesting content is kind of like. Um, remember when Twitter had Vine? You know, it's kind yeah. of that's where all the creative short form creators go. Um, but in terms of like overall as a channel, um, it's like scary a lot of what they're doing just from a like hooking people into that treadmill of video and like the amount of time spent there by young people. It's like vaping. It's like digital vaping. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's interesting to me that the kind of um, virtue signaling of what marketers support, you know, they're famous for that, unfortunately, mm -hmm. of kind of uh, the Kendall Jenner Pepsi ad is like, you know, the, the worst example of that. But um, not only is it bad for teens society <laughs> digital vaping is pretty amazing um you know it's also you know obviously run by a uh, country and that is you know having really bad human rights issues so it's interesting that the community hasn't uh, risen up against that in general you know is it even going to be around in three years um either from a legislative perspective or the fact that you know it's it's virality is um, you know, easy come, easy go. If something can skyrocket that quickly, what's the next uh, TikTok going to be? And so I, I don't know. I'm definitely bearish on TikTok for all those reasons. You know, and one of my um, one of my it's not spicy take, but just a take is that um, a lot of advertisers, some of them are mercenaries and they're just going to go anywhere there's eyeballs. Yep. And I, I also I, I've softened up and I'm, I'm nicer about a lot of things lately. And I think a lot of <laughs> advertisers are just trying to do their job post pandemic right. and they have a platform that they can put dollars into and get you know some dollars out so they don't they're so busy they're trying to you know service all of their clients and stakeholders and keep their business going and so um, I don't think they have the time or the bandwidth to ask some of the ethical questions that might not be something our industry um, ever gets to just to be completely frank right. and so um, I don't like I, as an advertiser can't outright ignore it but what i would if if i were a major consumer brand i would empower my users to share whatever i'm doing by creating an awesome in-store experience a great example of that is home depot they actually encourage um their staff can post like quirky videos of like people you can bring your dog into home depot and like their team members like post videos of people's dogs with permission right. and so they're actually empowering it at the front line um as opposed to like having like this big corporate presence so i think that that's a great way around it for a brand because if you're a big consumer brand you you know you, you sort of have to have some way to show up there because you don't want to cede that space to anyone else um but with that said i would be uh careful with how much of a bet i put into building a community there because right. who knows what's going to happen the other thing about TikTok is it's all of the um it's the goldfish audience of the web, right? It's the people who move from, you know, Friendster to MySpace to Facebook to uh, Twitter for a little bit to Instagram. They flirt from community to community. Mm -hmm. And I think they're the sort of, it's like the pop music culture mentality of what's the hot thing. Mm -hmm. And they, they're not looking at like, you know, what the CCP is doing or anything like that or data collection. They don't, you know, they're, they're not paying attention to that. They're not the people who block ads. So, um, you know, it is what it is. And um, I think it's interesting not to get in to politics, but, you know, Facebook's banned in China and right. we have TikTok here. So it's kind of, it's interesting. We're obviously um, running a different show here where, you know, we're not going to limit our products somewhere else. And um, it will be interesting to see how it shakes out. Um, for brands, though, I think that, 
you know, with, with, with any new channel, um, you know, try it out, but understand your risks, understand what you're doing. And we'll, we'll see how that shakes out with the user behavior standpoint. I still think there will eventually be a user backlash when people start to wake up and realize when you know you're hijacking their dopamine pathways and circuits for more attention and you're just going to burn people out versus like you know i think we all we all like reddit because we're, we're all you know nerds a little bit and niche communities are more nerds and it's it's more of a sustainable web community where you don't feel like if you don't log in for a day now you're existentially behind right so um i'm i remain perma bullish on online communities that um, are at a sane pace and aren't just, you know, mobile slot machines. And the ones that bias to being a slot machine, I think the problem is y you ultimately even burn the pop culture people out because what are they going to do? They're going to go to the next thing. So if I, but if I had to pick video, I would still put all of my chips on YouTube over TikTok. We'll see what happens with YouTube shorts. I think the format's great. Yep. They're in, they're like, Power creators are embracing it. Um, I think that content is cool. I'm, I still like the longer form YouTube best, though, so, personally. Yeah. So, okay, let's do a thought experiment. So if TikTok gets 86, you know, that whole uh, coveted, coveted audience of, you know, uh, teens, let's let's call them 16 to 25, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the, I guess, the most promising set of consumers right now for everybody. So what happens... If that if if TikTok does get eighty six, you know where what are the opportunities in this uh, outside of TikTok? They're going to use think? Nikita's gas product, obviously. Mm, yeah, that's blowing up, huh? Are, are we all friends with Nikita here? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, but shout out Nikita. <laughs> Um, anyway, well, I guess um, I'll, do we do we see any other opportunities of capturing this segment? Um, well, I think that's uh, an example of you know the up and coming new next. TikTok, um, I think that one seems to have a lot, I'm not on it, but seems to have a lot more stickiness and, you know, you kind of invest in the product a little bit more than you do in TikTok as a, as a lurker and a dopamine consumer. So that's there. Obviously, audiences are moving to um, CTV, have to plug out of home here, mm -hmm. you know, unmissable and highly responded to by that segment. And um, so I don't have any, you know, really informed takes on where the next generation is going to be. Those are some of the obvious ones. Right. I still think the most defensible strategy is always to do things where your company is remarkable and interesting enough to get shared in all of the social channels without you having to be there. And so that manifests with great out of home, with great TV ads, with great, you know, whatever else that you're creating is interesting enough that people will remix it, will share it, will meme it. Um, and of course, you can't force memes. Maybe you can. Shh. Anyway, um, and I think that's the way to be remarkable and be sustainable. And, you know, I've seen that with great brands. To use Dairy Queen again as an example, you know, they uh, – before they were on Facebook, there were about 5,000 – Facebook fan pages for the brand before the brand was ever on there, showing that their users were already sort of organizing around, you know, their, the love of soft serve. And so um, I think if your aspiration, you're a startup right now, and your aspiration is to be a major consumer brand, focus on that experience first, because at the end of the day, that experience is what's going to be shared at the end of the day. When you're marketing, if the check that you're writing for that experience doesn't meet it, then you know, at the end of the day, you're you're going to be um, not returning any ROI for your marketing. You're not going to get repeat customers, and you're just going to flame out. So um, I, I would focus there. You know, there's I, I know uh, you, you like Seth Godin, Chris. He talks about that yeah. a lot. Where the product is the marketing, and I think that's become even more true as everything gets more commoditized. Right. And the good news is, if you focus there, then when it comes time to write a check for marketing, your your marketing is just that much more effective. Yeah. And we're starting to see more experiential, experiential activations. I mean, I think we just walked past on the way here. We're, by the way, we're in, we're in Midtown, New York right now, but we are, we are walking down uh, Broadway and uh, saw like a Cometeer coffee cart out in the wild. And I thought that was pretty compelling. I think we're, we'll start to see more and more of that. Um, and ultimately we'll be able to share on through, I think, through our communities I think, and through our distribution lists. Yeah. Well. I think post pandemic people are coming out of their shells, they're returning to cities, they're taking more vacations. I know we're going to talk about trends in just a bit. They're, you know, returning to office, even if not every day. They're, you know, going in a few days a week to see their team. I think the social – we evolved for social interaction, right? There, a reason everyone's 
you know, depressed and anxious lately is, I think, the fact that they've been a little bit alone. And so getting people together is important. That's bullish for everything from out of home ads to, you know, um, small businesses and downtowns. And so it's, it's a good thing. Uh, let's talk about the, the the biggest thing in the news right now, which is OpenAI uh, valued at twenty nine billion dollars, getting a ten billion dollar investment from Microsoft. How does this change the game? Okay, I've got kind of two angles. Um, one is from the user perspective. I'll, I'll start there. Uh, I think it's pretty incredible, and what we're seeing is the basically the MVP. Mm-hmm. So imagine where it's going to go. Um, GPT three gets a lot of hype. I think that's the simplest user um, first step. You ask a question or make a request and you get a shocking response. Um, that's one of the early models. And this is happening across, you know, um, design creation, movie creation, video creation. And I don't see anything other than it being amazing um, and accelerating what people are able to do. Obviously, there's some some concern about, um, you know, if you're a copywriter or a designer, et cetera. But I think these things are always um, ultimately amplifiers of our uh, creativity. And it just will be some learning for us to figure out how to um, use the technology. Um, so on the user side, 100% excited. It's going to give so much leverage to individual creators, smaller teams to be able to compete in uh, against larger companies who have a specific individual who's an expert at uh, what now many of these AI models can uh, crank out. Um, specifically on the Microsoft angle, uh, what a chess move um, it seems. Uh, you know, I think two years ago, I thought Facebook and Google were basically untouchable um, now I'm not so sure. And, you know, Apple kind of pulled the rug out from Facebook to a large extent. Uh, Microsoft seems to be at, at least chipping away at what um, Google search results can provide. And to kind of uh, throw back to one of the earlier questions on Internet CPMs and cost of digital advertising, there can very well be a pretty quick race to the bottom here on either cost or user experience with ad load. I mean, uh, everybody has seen that you can't search Google without having to scroll uh, down the whole page to get a a non-sponsored result. Um, So if uh, Microsoft has a competing, uh, potentially better product, that is a a massive amount of pressure almost overnight that they can provide um, against Google. So, you know, the technology is obviously incredible. Um, really excited to see where that goes. And then the kind of business advertising implications are, are pretty massive as well. Well, I mean, they have the some of the best distribution in the game. Um, Adam, you're an ex-Googler. Let's hear what let's yeah, hear your I take. mean, Google would make the, <laughs> Google would make the argument that, you know, whether it's an organic search result or an ad, is it the best experience for a user? And so that could manifest if I was – like I, I'm moving this week, still yeah. in Austin, just a different place. And if I were to type in a query of moving company and I got a search extension that was an ad that just you know put in a dress from A to B and then one click I can get a quote, that's a pretty good experience. And they have a search ad extension that does that. So in that case – the ad might be better. And, you know, Google's able to productize a query that gets a user to that response faster. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of people don't like that because they're used to the 10 blue links world, which we know as SEOs has been dead for a long time. And it's not like Google owes a business anything or a company anything. Now, but in the minds of a lot of people, they're breaking the sort of like unwritten contract of the internet where, you know, if one company is going to have such a um, monopoly on on search, which is obviously high intent and powerful, mm-hmm. then they shouldn't be using that to bias ads. Um, and again, Google would say, well, you know, there's a lot of different companies bidding for auction. So there's another case to be made is, you know, maybe the internet, you know, we're talking about social networks having uh, subscription fees. Maybe the internet being free is sort of a, an, an anomaly that, you know, whether it's on the actual supplier demand side and that was just Rev1 and now, you know, 
internet 2.0 is everything is pay for play. And so that still might not mean as a user you have to pay, but someone's paying at some point. So um, we'll see how that manifests. One could also make the argument that that's an opportunity for a DuckDuckGo and for them to say, look, you know, we are biasing, you know, organic links. We are going to let, you know, whatever their algorithm uh, uses links, you know, other signals, quality brand to to sort out the best results. And they're going to heavily market that. And if that's something users want, then, you know, maybe they can take more market share. So there could be some sort of balancing function if they go too hard on ads. You know, I've seen Lots of people write, you know, blog posts and Twitter threads about, you know, what Matt said is the whole page is ads, right? Um, But then, you know, when I was at Google, we did user studies and the user satisfaction rate was always off the charts positive. So in my mind, whenever I see people complaining, I have to look at it and like really thoughtfully go, is this a company complaining like a Yelp that they're mad they're not getting so much free search traffic? Mm -hmm. Um, Or is this a genuinely a bad user experience for someone who doesn't even in their head consider if it's an ad or an editorial link, did they get the service that they wanted? So I I guess those are two different questions. I think the informational queries are a slightly different animal and we can get into that. But the service and like the the intent queries to like – buy, you know, pay for services of a moving company, I think those just are going to keep getting productized travel as well because there's too much money in it. And they sort of, as a public company, they they have to, um, you know, continue to increase profits and beat Wall Street. So here we are, you know, capitalization of the internet versus the, you know, the, the dorm room dream of everything being free. And um, I still think, though, that at some point it becomes an opportunity for a startup to do something that's more user centric and less beholden to a Wall Street, right? Yeah, there's a couple um, interesting kind of startup search engines, Nira, U.com. It'll be interesting to see what they can do if they're kind of powered by this engine of open AI and, and kind of have that head start of knowledge on and on the informational side um quick question on the google front were those surveys around whether uh they liked google as as a product or specifically around the sponsored uh experience and promotional because i'm a huge google fan like i think it's been a blessing to humanity and and that's not really that much of an overstatement but uh, so i have a lot of goodwill towards google and if i were asked i'd be like yeah i love google but i hate like feeling like I'm getting pimped out by, you know, six sponsored results before I get to what I'm really looking for. Yeah. I mean, I would say us as advertisers are acutely aware of when we're being sold to online. Mm, And I think even Google labeling things ad or sponsored, they changed it to sponsor pretty Mm -hmm. recently. Um, I I think people are in a hurry. They're busy. They're just trying to get information. Um, I think that that's one of the other things we've seen online um, in social with misinformation, with things that, you know, if you're a thinking human, you could go and, you know, do a little bit of research and be like, well, is this true? If a certain political side is saying something or a certain, um, you know, lobbying arm is saying something or a company, uh, but people, you know, don't ask those, you know, you know those probing questions. And so, it, you know, it, it is it, it is something where um, I, I think – that if Google breaches the trust of users, even as a trusted company, I think they're pretty aware of trying really hard not to do that. And so on the ad side, you know, there's quite a few barriers to, to actually ship an ad. And, um, you know, they, they're they manually approving things like, you know, new video ads on YouTube for, for pre-rolls. Um, and I think they're trying their best. I think they do a better job than, say, a Facebook or a Twitter with the campaign quality. Their ads quality team is pretty good. Mm-hmm. But um, to your point, though, other startups um, certainly have a David versus Goliath in to lean on that because I think as users become aware of things, then that can be a real selling point to get them to not use the product. We've seen it true with big CPG moving to a lot of these quirky D to C startups. You know, you, you always see a company on Shark Tank that's doing something um, more environmentally friendly, that's doing something um, more, you know, cause related, you, that's doing something 
something more okay pro family than this sort of blind you know this sort of monolithic structure of this you know giant institution and so um, that's that's always the opportunity of a startup mm-hmm. I think it's healthy for the world so let Google do the you know monetization thing to the extent that they want and mm-hmm. they'll be pushed back and it's it's always opportunity so uh, we'd like to cover more than just obviously advertising technology. Let's talk about the marketing technology implications and how marketers are going to be using this in their day to day. Maybe we could start with, I mean, we're B2B. Do we want to start with B2B, B2C? What do we think? Um, um, no, that we, I, we don't need to draw a line necessarily. Okay. So, I mean, um, obviously, or not obviously, but at Adequate, we are using AI to uh, you know, power some of the functions on, on our marketing and growth teams. Um, Matt, what are some of the opportunities that you you see, um, at least for, not necessarily uh, oh, the AI piece in the context of ads, but you know how do you how do you think that the Chat GPT will you know basically assist or will assist marketers uh, with their campaigns and execution and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it might be a, a shoehorn response to the question, but where my mind immediately jumps is. Uh, if you view customer support as a kind of marketing adjacent function, a right. lot of times it's the interface between your customer and you. Mm-hmm. And there, I can't imagine a more powerful, um, unique, customized engine to um, allow companies to do good customer support and, and potentially a little bit of marketing there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so for everything from product education to FAQs to tutorials, like imagine and and i don't think you need to imagine so hard anymore that every user has their own personal uh feeling like an individual onboarder um Mm -hmm. so i think that's uh important for b2b um you know a lot of it's very niche and you know there's a learning curve often in many b2b products b2c um more on the kind of order issues returns like where's my stuff where's my stuff all those kinds of questions can be really uh, answered in a high touch way that feels every it makes every customer feel like oh my gosh like this company really loves me and so that's where my mind goes and I think it's going to be the biggest improvement um, and again kind of like arming the rebels like a local business can have the same level of support as Amazon um, powered by a lot of this and I think it'll get really interesting I haven't seen a lot of this yet it almost feels inevitable that it'll be uh you know the the some of the successes from chat gpt will be how quickly can the algorithm and and engine adapt to our company voice Mm -hmm. our company problems like you know you upload our you know from the instacart example or you know you upload your zendesk instance and it automatically learns common questions common answers company tone um specific policies and etc how quickly can it be customized to um that you know kind of neat super niche uh response set and and uh inputs from a customer service perspective i think it's really interesting right because what you said it's like in my head when you were talking about like a better FAQ, that that's actually super cool because sometimes you're looking through like if it's a really complex piece of software and there's a specific question, it would be cool to get that answer instantly. Um, but I think for like general customer support questions, um, I think it gets most interesting when the GPT can solve a problem for me. Like, um, you know, maybe it's a medical expense I've already paid that they keep pestering me for. Like if the chatbot can actually close that out on the system and solve my issue. That gets super interesting versus, you know, me just asking questions because I know that if I call a company for support right now and I get one of those automated menus, I'm frustrated. And I think people are smarter than we get, give them credit for. Like I'm even frustrated if I'm giving, given a human chatbot type person where, you know, they're unable to help me pretty quickly. So I think the faster, like it becomes magical when you can get me to solutions on the, on the, at least consumer facing side. Um, Cause otherwise, what if you run the risk of just basically putting people through the same type of customer service hell they get when they're trying to dial a bank right now and you press one for this, you know, press three for this and eventually get to a person and, you know, hopefully not just replacing that experience with something else. And then you, then you realize that they don't have the requ- requisite uh, privileges or permissions to actually ex- or to solve your problem. They got to go up upstream to a manager or two managers. And, and there's any number of books on this because it's an obvious one, but customer service is marketing as well. Right. Your great customer service experience, you're going to tweet about. You're going to tell your friends at a dinner party. You're going to, and then this 
the reverse is true. If you have an awful customer service experience, it's like universally known that, you know, your healthcare, you know, your insurance provider is, you know, really bad. Like in a lot of cases, it feels like they're trying to deny you coverage and fight you there. That may be true. That may not be true, but it's just, you know, universally felt as a bad thing. So if companies can use technology to improve the customer service experience in a meaningful way, like what a great marketing tool for them as well. Um, we we're also talking about marketing and chat GPT. A lot of this is around, um, I think things that wouldn't make a marketer um, a marketer's hair stand up and get upset. I think where we start to see marketers getting upset will be if you say things like, chat GPT is going to remove the need for you to have copywriters. And they're gonna write better taglines for your business than you know a marketing team could. And I would say that of course they can't. You know They don't understand the nuance of a business. They're not gonna be able to draft uh, creative headlines for you. But, you know, maybe what they could do is, um, you know, get you to, and I think Google does this already. If you have one tagline, they can recommend 10 back that you can go run a test for. And performance marketers would like that. You're making their jobs more efficient. Yep. But I don't, I don't see a world where like a brand marketer is going to give that away to the to the machines because I think there's still something that machines can't really capture uh, to give you, you know, like a, a tagline that stands the test of time that people a hundred years from now are still going to uh, say about your company and your brand. Like, you know, it's not going to come up with think different, right, for Apple. There's, there's still like this, you know, the, the creative highest level part of marketing um, should be done by humans. And then um, the actual execution to whatever extent you can make that easier, um, if, if that can be done with AI or other software, of course you'd use that. Uh, but the discussions, at least with my marketing hat on, that, that sort of um, grind my gears a little bit. And these right. are are typically by engineers who think, you know, okay, I'm going to build the perfect nurture campaign for you with GPT. Well, maybe you could do that, but it requires actually knowing how to set up a nurture in the first place. So that's that's where I start to um, ask questions when um, people are talking about taking away like a tactical mix from marketers, which engineers love doing on the web, and that can end in some bad places. I've seen, for example, um, Uber, who's a great company, I have many friends who work there. Early on, they were um, running campaigns where they were sort of a little bit, um, they, they were targeting cohorts that they shouldn't have been explicitly targeting. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't have done it the way they did with semestering. There was quite a bit of backlash. You can imagine where, where this is going, and rightfully so. But if you're an engineer, you couldn't, you're not thinking about broader, you know, context of politics when you're creating a campaign and you're targeting. And so I, the machines probably will never get there. I don't think these are all machine problems. I think a lot of them are, are human problems as well. Not to go off on too much of a tangent. So, so what you're saying is we're not going to be hiring prompt marketers anytime soon, <laughs> or maybe we will. Um, I mean, well, there's a, there's there's a handful of AI solutions that are built on top of AI. Uh, ones that come to mind are Paul Yacobian's Copy AI. The other being Jasper is a big one that we see um, in the news. I mean, I mean, is the, this a fad or is this going to stick around? If I can, if I'm a if I'm a business owner and I can type in a box, um, you know, bring me. A thousand customers to my restaurant this weekend, and that will bring me a thousand customers. Great! I don't need a marketing team anymore. And guess as marketers, we can all go do something else because that will have been solved. But I, I don't think we're at that point. There's no Star Trek computer to do things like that. When I worked on Google Analytics, you know, I told my users repeatedly there is no easy button in Google Analytics because they always wanted an easy button. And you know, you have to ask the right questions of your data. You have to have the meta context of your business and what you're trying to do. So um, I would. If if I were you know anyone from a startup uh, to an S and P company, just be really wary of companies offering easy button solutions with oh sprinkle AI or sprinkle blockchain on it. And when they lead with buzzwords, there's a reason they're doing that because they are trying to either get evaluation at a certain point or create FOMO that your company has to use them. And maybe you do, but I would I would just my spider sense tingles when we have new technology and new buzzwords that people are you know selling as you know solutions to all of our problems. And yeah, I'm I'm curious what their you know they being the uh, the applications built on top of yeah those startups I'm curious what their 
angles will become because when the underlying engine is as good as good as it already is what's their you know incremental secret sauce i i don't know i mean i've used both and i was dramatically more impressed with actually the core uh open ai chat gpt3 so it'll be interesting to see what they create as their angles i mean it's super interesting because um even before chat gpt there was the uh the dolly image generation you can yeah. like generate pretty much whatever image you want. Um, and so, like, what is the use of a stock photo or what do people use to get stock photos right now? iStock, Shutterstock, Getty. And if you, Getty, and if you query, you know, um, you know, teacher with an Apple, you already get like that mar those marketplaces are like fairly mature and saturated with any number of really well done and, and also scrappy um, ideas and content that you then pay a creator for. Um, I really think the only thing that that's solving is, you know, if you're getting into really abstract layers of, you know, creative that don't exist, which I, I would be shocked if there's something that anyone is querying for like a normal piece of business stock footage that you couldn't also buy on Shutterstock. I think their real value is the fact that you would maybe only pay 10 cents for something mm -hmm. you previously had to pay $100 to a creator for. Now, kind of the dark timeline shit here is you're basically not incentivizing any new creative, whether right. it's stock photo creative or any other type of creative. And then we're just going to say, well, the corpus is exhausted. Of what, like we've created the corpus of everything, which we know isn't true or, you know, ever can be true with creative. And now you're just, you know, is it good to incentivize everyone to just be a prompt engineer and not an end creator? Are we saying this is enough? We solved it, right? So th th there's like broader, big philosophical questions here. I feel like no one asks because you know we're we're moving fast and breaking things and you know we don't care if we put any number of photographers or copywriters out of business we're trying to make money here um so i wonder there also could be a backlash right um especially in the ad industry um as engineers take more and more of um the platforms and the sort of direction of advertising like is there at some point some sort of rebellion from the grizzled creatives and you know pro humans among us who like the fact that you know we're also enabling these great creators to to do better creative and um you know is it all just about margin for us and is it you know do we want to be run ever and ever leaner i think yes to an extent and then you get to a point where there's probably diminishing returns. So um, I think the for me, like the optimistic case is AI and any sort of software lets us be more efficient with the parts of work that just take time and aren't fun for anyone and let us focus our time more on the really creative stuff and the and and like the you know the the conceptual things and and moving towards ever better creative work and ever higher conversion work um just my only existential concern there is um you know what if that industry only needs to employ um you know half the people that are here now what if it's only one tenth who knows i don't know the answers to these questions but there, there's a lot of things here that that we're we're just figuring out. Um, another case here is everyone, um, the ad sector needs fewer people managing, you know, accounts and platforms. Certainly, you know, we're guilty of this at AdQuick. We're making it more efficient to run out of home ads. There's a huge uh, group of people who require to run out of home ads now. And, you know, I, I would argue for that, like, you know, those moving papers, pile A, pile B type things and securing uh, its calendars. Again, those are jobs like no one wants to do those jobs. You want to be doing the creative work. So I guess it, it's going to be up to us like when we ask questions of what to automate, how to automate it. And I think the most important one is why are we automating it? And so once we think through that, we can hopefully get to better software, better work, and people can be happier doing ad work because I think ad work done right is something everyone enjoys. So. Yeah, so some of the initial use cases have been creative in nature, and uh, this will, no, without a doubt, have some sort of impact on uh, the, the larger creative agency uh, space. Do you think this will lead to more in-housing? Because I mean, if you get inspired by you know, an, an, AI, an AI bot, that's half, half the battle, right? Yeah, I think in and of itself, this is a factor towards in-housing. When you can take uh, a lot of the brainstorming and, and kind of getting the initial list of, okay, what do we want our tagline for this campaign to be mm -hmm. um, and, and put that in a software platform? Yes, that, uh, that definitely encourages some in-housing. I think 
um, separate from uh, AI and, and chat, chat GPT-3 is something that I was surprised that's happening. That's a, a countervailing force, I think, in my opinion, is the uh, the growing like long tail of retail networks and niches. That's actually, you know, where there's complexity and kind of dynamic um, components to um, ad mediums. I think that actually benefits agencies because they create, you know, maybe air quotes expertise, but at least serviceable expertise across, you know, 60 digital platforms and within CTV and, and all the other channels and are able to, uh, you know, take that delegation from brands. This is bringing certainly some more capabilities in-house for creatives. Um, so some interesting forces at play there. I mean, if I were to look at it from the other angle, one can argue that the agencies can continue to do their services and offer these services, but there might not be an account or an industry or a service level specification. So maybe you don't have uh, a, a, an individual working on like only airlines or only this because that's what their domain expertise is. But if you have the right tools, you can in effect become an expert at other verticals that historically perhaps you haven't worked on. I, I'm also, the, the one thing about all of the AI stuff that actually does make me excited is um, imagine you're like, imagine it creates the opportunity for a shit hot design agency to have its own style. And you see this design agency right. style and it like, you know what you're getting with them, right? Like if you, um, like, what's that company? Uh, the Death Water Company? Liquid, Liquid Death. Liquid yeah. Death. Like they have blown up huge because they have a style. It's bottled water. It's this boring commodity thing, but they, the the packaging and the, you know. Taglines the, murder your the thirst. Tagline. So, so I think that's not something an AI could create. So. <laughs> But you can imagine a boutique design shop in, you know, on Madison Avenue or, you know, somewhere in a quirky neighborhood in Detroit that, you know, they, they have this edgy punk kind of style that, you know, certain brands are attracted to and the AI can't copy it and they're using tools internally. But I think that future is interesting because now ad shops aren't these boring commodified things. You go to them when you want something the AI can't do. And, um, you know, they're probably the people that are going to make the coolest creative and ad quick and, you know, in YouTube and any, anywhere else because they're going to do the things the the robots can't do, which is that's like the, the, the blue sky scenario is AI lets creative people have more time to be creative. You're not excited about the fact that Children across the country won't have to write bullshit essays <laughs> for their homework anymore. Well, I mean, that, that's such an interesting one because we had the internet when we were writing essays, and there's always been technology. There's copyscape where you can basically tell if something's plagiarized. I think if you're, I, I'm actually less concerned about that threat the more I think about it because if you're a teacher, like you can read something and tell the AI has a certain style to it. You know, it it, it has a lot of um, weird sort of intro phrases we might assume that or you know some are saying that right like there, there's it, it reads like a college essay right you know and, uh, perfect grammar you know which most people don't use <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually less concerned and I, that actually gets us away i from think that's a good thing by the way just embrace it yeah. you know like having i can't remember how many times i spent an hour formatting to get to the page limit and it's like you know is that really <laughs> you know what the what secret was what you uh Co uh, copy all the periods and then you you change the font size of the periods and that gives you extra length on wow. the paper. There you go. You're really struggling to get to that two page. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so okay, so we've so we don't think that, you know, we think this will be a net positive for agencies. Um, what are some of the other exciting things um, AI can, can kind of help marketers with, at least initially? What do you think, Adam? Um, I mean, everybody's coming to us with like, oh, outbound, your, you replace your outbound team. I think it's a, a good compliment, not a pure replacement. Uh, we're still in the early stages. Can, can I be really annoying? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm going to give a non-answer. Oh, I love it. I think companies are still not doing things like using analytics property, mm -hmm. I, properly. I don't think companies are doing things like even A-B testing their website or having really great nurture campaigns. I, I don't think that... We have nailed like the basics of what digital marketing can do right now. And oh, we want to play with the shiny toy over here. So some brands that are super sophisticated might be ready. But mm -hmm. um, in my experience as a consultant and you know working with any number of startups and large companies alike, um, I think like the most value is 
to do better at what is right in front of you before you're sort of playing at the edge. I know we're going to talk about crypto in just a second, but all of these brands, um, for instance, that were excited to create metaverse experiences, I went to their websites and I, you know, looked at some basic things like, you know, they, they had duplicate uh, title tags on their site, right? Like they're not even doing SEO uh, correctly. You know, they, they probably have parts of their site, no index that they want index that they don't even think to look at. Mm -hmm. And we're off playing playing with shiny objects. I mean, there's like a level of sophistication and, um, you know, if even small businesses, right? Like a lot of small businesses, their sites are just a PDF menu. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard to have the real menu. And um, I can be, you know, find you so much easier in search and that experience can be made better. So, um, you know, sort of get your house in order before you start to use these shiny new tools. Um, and if you already, great. I also do think that, you um, Come startups like you know AdQuick and you know maybe it's CRM platforms and marketing automation tools are probably going to bring in a lot of um, you know the right APIs to use AI for for us. So I think that that's probably as likely a scenario as some magic new startup builds something no one else is using. Um, and so probably a lot of the power of AI ends up in your marketing stack. Whether you're like, you know, building connectors yourself, or whether it's some uh, startup. Also, a lot of the young people building these startups are, you know, they're focused on a lot of consumer problems, as young startups typically are. I remember in the last cycle, everyone wanted to build their own travel app. It was like right. there was like the thousandth travel app, and it's like no one was. There were only a few people building like, like a, a like a you know, sales optimization app or like a B2B marketing app, right? These are like different problems. So um, I think like the sexy engineering stuff to be done with AI is probably not gonna be, like there's a few people working on marketing tools, but they're not that good. They're, they're not ready to do those things. And mm -hmm. it's probably a feature or an integration in something existing. So um, the short of it is if I were a brand, I wouldn't, as I said, with crypto and Web3, I hate that term. Um, you don't need to do anything here. There's not anything for you. You need to kick butt with your current marketing. Um, and we can get into the crypto discussion if you want. Again, I was on the Crypto Critics podcast. We had like a two-hour <laughs> rant. So I don't know that we need to go through this too much. We can a little bit. But I think like the opportunity is right in front of you as a marketer right now, whether you're a small small company or a large company, to go out and get users, especially now where – you know, we're coming out of a time where I think it was a hard time for, for everyone. I think when I talk to my friends, they're actually super excited to try new services or excited to, you know, try a new, um, you know, food delivery company. They're excited to go to a new restaurant. They're excited to try a new, um, you know, messaging platform. And that hasn't been the case for a while. We talked about people being sort of lulled into their habits. I right. think like now is a good time to market new things. Well, maybe I give you that chance to condense your two-hour rant to something a little bit smaller. I mean, might, might as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's the tail whacking the dog. All of these companies are, you know, trying to shoehorn blockchain into things that have no business using blockchain. And I think the killer app with blockchain is probably Bitcoin. That's going to be the project that survives, mm -hmm. uh, whether, you know, I think it's mostly used as digital gold and hedge against inflation. Yeah. Okay. Um, that narrative aside, you know, there, it, th there's a core amount of really passionate people. And then the rest of it is just become, Griff you know, City. Griff City and speculate financial speculation. I don't know how brands have become tied up in this. Um, but it is blowing my mind because I thought we were through this already. For all of the young marketers, there was a time when companies were really excited about advert games. And advert games were these really expensive uh, customer experiences that were built by digital agencies who were more than excited to charge big companies seven figures to build this brand experience that they weren't accountable to anyone actually using. And I thought that was over and we're seeing literally the same thing with brands creating metaverse experiences where 30 people show up and they're doing it to get press from industry media, which by the way, as a consumer brand, your users don't care. And then <laughs> win an award and go to, uh, you know, Kane's Lions and be able to use that on their resume for the next 
company and is very uh, careerist, mm-hmm. and it's clearly by people who you know they, they make they make that their personal brand of you know doing something new and bold, but. There's the notion of experimenting and trying new technologies, which is good. But I think if you're a big company, you do that quietly in a sandbox. You figure out what works, and you don't you're, you don't take a hundred year old brand and write "We all gonna make it, friend" responding to people on Twitter, <laughs> and then get dragged for the next three years. There's like no reason to for it. Like, what are you doing? You're you're basically. You know, you're, you're kind of cheapening your brand. You're, it feels thirsty, like the "Hello, fellow kids" meme. So, <laughs> yes. Steve Buscemi. Yeah, That's the and best. So you, and so, I, I, I think if you're a major brand and there is going to be a sea change, there's basically it's it's not like you need to be early to Facebook stock or early to Bitcoin. You're a brand. You get to sit back and see, you know, what works, what doesn't, and when it makes sense to participate, participate. But you don't, um, you know, don't jump into a fight for no reason if you're just sitting on the sidelines. You know, um, there's a great quote. Um, it's either by Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger where they said. Um, investing is the greatest game of all time because you don't have to swing at every pitch. You can wait for the one that comes at the exact place across the plate that you want to swing at it. And that's true in marketing um, if you're a big brand as well. Now, for a startup, that's different. You might want to push on the gas a little bit and be really provocative and say, well, you know, stupid things. But you could say things like, Oh, you know, fiat currency is BS. We all know it's not. But they're, you know, being provocative. They get attention. Maybe you can walk that back later if you bring in users. Maybe not. Um, But they're sort of playing a different game than you're a large brand, you know, building a metaverse experience. 20 people show up to. I I just think it's embarrassing. I mean, I thought it was rather interesting that that the luxury brands and large consumer uh, conglomerates, consumer product goods conglomerates jumped into this space given that there are points of friction, which is like owning a set of goggles or a headset or, you know, like the, the audience size isn't there, but yet they jumped into this. Yeah, it's you know the the notion of FOMO is 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 real at the um, not just the investor level but also people working brand side also get FOMO and they think they have to do what's new. I think for a long time there was only upside to being early to everything, and I think again I was talking about marketers lulled into the sense of security. Um, I think you have to ask questions. You have to keep asking why, and it's your job to make bets which also means it's your job to not make bets. So you have to know where you're going to place your chips on the table and you have to be smart about it. And, you know, again, I think the companies that stay really focused and have this nice long-term strategy um, are the ones that succeed really well. And it's even for startups, I think the startups that mostly win, if you talk to the uh, early marketers, we have marketers who were at Airbnb fairly early, they figured out one or two channels that worked really well for them. And that's all they did. That's all they did. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, do a few things really well while you're resource constrained. And as you get more resources, you can do more. So, you know, we were talking about AI and not just, you know, doing it to do it. I think um, to me, all of the Web3 stuff is the rebranding of blockchain because venture capitalists had to create another hype cycle in order to raise more funds, in order to you know sell their tokens, in order to get their NFT marketplaces up and look, you know, I guess hands off to them to try to create the hype to 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 bootstrap these from zero to one. Mm-hmm. But I think um I think that experiment has kind of failed. You know, the notion of digital value is real. I just don't think it's real in the way that they think it is. I think, you know, there was this dream of, um, you know, you hear the A16 guys, oh, you can own like a part of a superhero franchise. Why would they? Why would they let you do that? Why, like that's not the model of 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 Hollywood. They're not going to let you own a piece of that. So the the thought that oh, this is going to emerge. Um, you know, it's going to emerge bottom up and it's going to be this groundswell. Well, that can work for ideas, but for a superhero franchise, it's just not how that gets funded. So I don't understand where they ever thought that that would emerge. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of ideas and a lot of think fluencing. And, um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I own a Bitcoin cause I think it, I wanted to kick the tires and experiment with it, but I don't own anything else in the space. I issued an NFT SMR to go through the process. I'm 
I'm not a believer. I think it was Did a fun. Did anyone exp- buy your NFT? Yes, yeah. actually, we raised. What was it? Um, one of my songs I issued a video NFT for. We raised seven thousand uh, dollars in Ethereum in like two hours. But this was at the peak of the okay. NFT craze, right. and I have friends that have it, they have very. Um, concentrated ethereum positions who were happy to just put money on it so that was part of a bubble Mm -hmm. you know i didn't want to do the whole um who's that guy that sold the 69 mil yeah people thing like i I didn't want to raise money like that but i'm like yeah if you guys want to bid on this i'll just donate it to saint jude so we raised some money for i i took some of the some of the fluff from markets and helped you know kids with cancer that was cool at least something good came out of that hype cycle (laughs) yeah i think the punchline is it's a technology sleeking a solution um, and it's trying to be shoehorned into way too much. Uh, I think it is kind of beautiful from a like technologist perspective, decentralized, mathematical, you know, software. Um, so I think if you started society from scratch today, a lot more things might have blockchain components. But you know, you're not going to burn everything down to just build it back up, and the switching costs can be super high. So I think the the with outside of like the marketing and the technology stuff on the the finance side specifically the exchange side they're without finreg there it's too juicy to basically do things that you can't do at a you know traditional um you know trad fi exchange um and no one would ever know but until they do until they do so um you know, I think the 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 people who have the one the one meme from that whole thing was you know not your keys, not your coins. Like having your 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 crypto stored offline in cold storage was ultimately a safer play. And now we're sort of going backwards because it's almost the you know it's like a little bit of the gold bug mentality mm-hmm. of having you know the cash or gold under your bed. And now we're not even online anymore. So it's like Satoshi's vision of a you know and. It, a peer-to-peer electronic cash like i i think for that part it like makes sense to use like a little bit at a time but have most of it offline but it's this interesting thing because at the beginning of this podcast we were talking about well brand shouldn't do things that don't have a great user experience and in my head i thought but they never thought through that with crypto like even with bitcoin the user experience is terrible you mean losing a pile of money is not a great experience right there's some guy in the uk who's 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 tried to search a dump for the last oh, yeah, seven about years this. to get his bitcoin and he even raised like some venture funding to like get like uh, machines to go in there and the <laughs> dump people refuse to let them they're like we the dump just, people are going after it now well they're like it's an environmental disaster guys we can't just dig this stuff up even though they raise the money yeah. but it's it's not good that this is what people are focused on right it's you took yeah. all these technologists and you gave them a chart that they stare at all day instead of building i mean that's not healthy <laughs> well we were pr- promised fractional ownership and we ended up getting you, you can know, buy fractional co- ownership co- of collectibles and, and trading cards effectively well i like alts i like alt investments like you know owning a piece of art is a cool thing masterworks is a cool startup it's I mean, totally separate I mean, alt. I mean, you could think of uh, all the new stuff uh, that's coming out right now as alternative channels for marketers, right? Yes, hundred I mean, percent. That's one way to slice it. And yeah. Do you put all your eggs in that basket? Probably not, right? When you're when you're th- thinking about investing, are you are you you know taking all your money and putting it into the safest store of value or the non the, the least safest store well, of value? The the alts are interesting though because they're non correlated. So if we were looking at it from a, a marketing standpoint, like if you're going to try a channel that's a non like Facebook or um, you know, Fang channel, then they're not correlated to what happens with those big companies. Like they might just keep going up on their own. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll see more and more retail media outlets come up as a result of this. Yeah. Everything's an ad network, right? Exactly. If, uh, <laughs> everything, everything in the physical world will be monetized. Mm-hmm. You, you have every a, experience will be monetized. I, I like the back of your laptop has a, uh, Don Draper meme where it says cars, cars with ads on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got that sticker from our friends at Carvertize. It was great. Um, it was so good, I had to put it on. It's it's awesome. Mr. Powell at the Federal Reserve is kind of uh, you know making making people's lives a little challenging. Um, I'd love to hear your take on uh, what macro, how macro is going to influence marketers in 2023. Yeah. um, Well, obviously, it's been a crazy ride in the macro environment from uh, the pandemic when the fiscal response was massive stimulus. And that was on the back of a decade of zero interest rates from the Fed. And that's how you get crypto bubbles, um, et cetera. 
Um, and so when the supply side shock of COVID had factories shut down, cargo rates uh, skyrocketing, the kind of uh, excess wealth that was flowing through the economies going into the housing market, in my estimation, everything has so showed signs of significant cooling very quickly. Again, kind of easy come, easy go. Mm -hmm. The inflation came really quickly with the uh, really large supply sh side shock that made everything more expensive combined with the uh, stimulus that made people feel pretty wealthy or, or rel relatively too wealthy. So he's been vocal and consistent over the past year, probably late. I think, uh, you know, the transitory thing is now like laughable and uh, – be a harder laugh if it wasn't, you know, seriously kind of affecting certain uh, groups. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, stability is what the economy wants. There's so many green shoots. Uh, everything's opening back up. Employment is still really high. And, and Powell's used the blunt instrument of tamping down the demand side, which is the only thing the Fed can do. Mm -hmm. um, now that the supply side is coming back online, people are moving back into the workforce. And you know, there's some culling in the the white collar market. I, I heard it recall, uh, called a white collar recession. I right. think that's probably a, an all in reference. But yeah, I think that's accurate. Is a lot of the high flying tech companies, but Main Street is doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. Small businesses and local businesses are doing well. And so, over the next you know three to six months, I think we get to a uh, a more of a pause, less aggressive rates rising, and uh, then kind of business as usual for a couple years. What do you think about the new normal uh, that's coming? Come on, Jerome, drop it back to zero percent. Let's take this roller coaster around again. <laughs> Burr, baby. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean the, the 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 Fed is certainly going not full Volker, but you know they're, <laughs> full they're, Volker. They're pulling they're pulling the sticks back up on this on this bad boy. So yeah, I'm not a I'm not a macro economist. I I am of the mindset we cannot change the wind. We can only adjust the sails, and so. Um, I, but I'm still hope, somewhat hopeful that we've been through enough of the uh, burning off the excess of the dry forest. You know, the idea that the economy, if you let it go too long, becomes this overgrown forest. You need a controlled burn. Um, there's obviously, um, as we exit, hopefully, the golden age of grifting where there was too much easy money because obviously that wasn't healthy for anything. Right. Um, hopefully we get to a more balanced level of sanity we obviously couldn't have zerp forever but um i i think you know we probably um companies will be more conservative until they sort of get their hands forced by competitors because it's a little bit of an arms race once people decide you know in, in a sector to go more aggressively um but hopefully this next cycle is um not as um not as wild on on both ends you know the idea of a soft landing well maybe we could have like a a more like you know not having to raise rates immediately i think obviously a pandemic caused this and other things again i'm not a macro economist so yeah just riffing on that a little bit it's it's a really interesting time to be kind of a um teenage incumbent and why I mention that is that I think a lot of the big brands are concerned about their stock price. They're very cautious. Um, and behavior change must be at its highest because of first 23 is like the first year out of the pandemic. You know, I can't believe we're actually saying that, but it's the first time when we're not really thinking it's going to matter at all. Even last year was like, is it going to come back? And so feeling good there, if I were a brand in that space, like what a time to be at that stage when you can grab market share, take advantage of things that other companies aren't doing and, and you know, zig when they zag. So um, I think that's pretty exciting if, if you're in that stage. I've even seen um, I've even seen people excited about taking cruises again this year, and that was something cruises that, are killing it. Yes, and I've seen really great cruise marketing. I think the cruise industry, like, what a fun industry to do marketing in. So when I'm seeing things like that, and you know, travel ads, um, it it makes me feel you know pretty good about the year. Uh, putting the Fed aside, just from a mm -hmm. consumer sentiment perspective, right. we you know it seemed like. As you noted, the pandemic overhang didn't give us the roaring 20s straight away. But I think um, you walk around New York right now, and I've been here you know, two or three times since the pandemic. This is the most normal New York it's felt. And so that's that's something to be excited about. I think, you know, People are probably tired of hearing about, you know, the Fed and interest rates and all this. I think people want to live their lives now and are going to do that regardless of, you know, what a number on a chart sits. So. 
Yeah. Amen. Cool. Well, I think that's a great spot, a great place to kind of wrap this up. And um, thank you for joining us um, on the Advertising Podcast. And of note, of the future, we are going to have many uh, types of guests, marketers, it's right. startup only founders. founders. Yeah, yeah. This is, um, this, this, <laughs> starting yeah, off with I'm, a whimper. I've been racked with fucking nerves this whole time. So. No, I meant me as a oh, guest. Oh, yeah, but, only up from there oh, from okay. a guest perspective. Chris, you're great. You're great on camera. Oh, thanks, audio. Thanks, babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we'll see you soon.